Coleman. That's uh, about as much as I know. <laughs> uh, welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, as Julie said, I'm a developer advocate from the Google London office. I don't sound like I'm from London, and that's because I'm not originally from America. But um, yeah, I'm here to tell you about something I'm really excited about. Uh, the last time I gave this talk, the person before me gave a talk about how she was using machine learning to detect asteroids heading for the Earth. And uh, she won this contest with NASA to find these objects before they get close to us. So it was a little bit of a hard, hard act to follow because my talk isn't actually going to save the Earth from Armageddon. Uh, but I do hope to be able to convince you that you have access to some really amazing powers nowadays if you look in the right places and if you uh, learn how to use them carefully. Oh, um, these slides are available at bit.ly slash mco superpowers. So if you need to access them or want to access them after the talk, I'll leave them up for the rest of the life of the universe. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, I, as I said, or, or as Julie said, I'm a developer advocate, which means my job is basically to help developers take advantage of the Google Cloud platform. So it's OK to email me if I can help you in any way. That's my Twitter handle, Mark A. Cohen, and that's my personal website. So with that out of the way, what I'd like to cover today is a little bit of background on ML, just to get us all onto the same page. And then I want to talk about some superpowers. I'll tell you a little bit of my history, the first superpower I ever acquired. And then we'll look at how we can power applications in the services domain, the app domain, and then in the learning area. So let's just start with some background. How many people feel like they already get machine learning, know what it's all about, have used it? I'd say maybe 60%. So I'll kind of go through this section quickly, but I like to just do a level set to explain for people who haven't yet had experience with it what it's all about, what this fuss is all about. Um, anybody recognize this sentence or know what it's known for? It's, uh, it has every letter of the English alphabet in it. So I see people going A, B, C. <laughs> You're checking me. Um, trust me, it does. But I've tweaked it. It's normally written differently. It's normally written the quick brown fox, and I've written it the brown quick fox. Does that look strange to anyone or seem okay or not? Yeah. So native English speakers look at this sentence and they say, that just doesn't sound right. It's not the, quick, the brown quick fox, it's the quick brown fox. And it's not just because that's how they've heard the sentence. It's actually wrong in that order. Does anybody know why? Is anybody brave enough to venture a guess? <laughs> this is a big room. Because our English teacher told us so. Sorry? Because our English teacher told us so. Because your English teacher told you so. That is a reason, okay, but it's not the real the order, of order of adjectives. Very good. So very few people know this. There's a very distinct ordering of adjectives in English. It looks like this. Quantity or number goes first, then quality, then size, age, shape, color, proper adjective, and purpose or qualifier. So quick brown, quick is a qualifier or a quality, and brown is a color. So it's quick brown, not brown quick. Does anybody know this? I don't, I've never met anybody who could tell me that list in my, I, I've given this slide, I've presented this slide to a lot of people many, many native English speakers. I've never met anybody who could say to me, oh yeah, it's quantity, and then it's quality, and then it's size, and then nobody knows it. But in a sense, every English speaker knows it, especially people who learned English as a, ch as a child, but you just don't know you know it. And that is really the essential idea behind machine learning. It's learning from examples and experience, not from rules. So we don't even know those rules but we know them from experience. This concept is not new. It was actually stated in this way. I really like this, this version of it. Instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, 
Why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? That's kind of what, it's, what machine learning is all about. It's about teaching software the same way we teach children, by exposing them to patterns over and over again until they start to absorb those patterns and the difference between what's, uh, what's in this category, what's in that category. Anybody want to guess who said this? This is like some kind of a trivia game this talk is turning into. Um, it was Alan Turing, and he said that in 1950. So I think that's pretty impressive that you know, he saw this insight, um, what is that, 70 years ago? When I was in graduate school, uh, I won't say when, it was a long time ago, there was this um, thing we would say, which was that we have some amazingly fast computers now, but they still can't do something a toddler can do, which is to tell a cat from a dog. For 30 some odd years, that was the case. And then all of a sudden, it started to change. So as far back, as recently, rather, as 2009, people were still saying that, that old saying. And then suddenly in 2012, it, it changed. We were able to do it. Finally, we could recognize a cat. The problem was it took 16,000 processors to do it. Uh, in 2015, algorithms started beating humans at image recognition, so they now do better than humans. And in 2016, we have algorithms that perform, outperform inexperienced radiologists. And then just this month, I saw this headline. They're now better than not just inexperienced radiologists, not just radiologists, but specialists. They're actually as good as or better than specialists. Does that mean specialists are no longer needed? No. It probably means that the combination of the tool and the specialist is going to give us a much better ability to diagnose things than we've ever been able to do before. So things have changed very rapidly. I think it's fair to call this a revolution. What, what happened? Why did suddenly, after all this time of not being able to tell a cat from a dog, why did, are we suddenly able to diagnose breast cancer better than we ever have been able to before? I think it's a bunch of reasons, and there are probably some I'm going to miss, but this is my, my personal list. One is that the hardware has kept getting better and better. We have this concept called Moore's Law, which has accounted for the rate of change of hardware over the last, you know, 30-ish years, 40 years, maybe even a little bit more. Moore's Law has started to run out. It's not, we're not getting any more of that increase that we thought we were going to keep getting into the future indefinitely. But we're also seeing a big revolution in specialized hardware like GPUs and, and TPUs, processors that are specifically designed to help with these kind of deep learning algorithms. Cloud computing has changed everything. You don't need to be a you know, replicate Google's data centers or Facebook's data centers. You can just borrow them or rent them. We, I guess you pay for it. Um, there's more data available than ever before. The data sets that are available online, they're staggering, and they keep kind of going up exponentially. So you have at your fingertips right now more data than anyone in the history of humanity. The open source movement has been huge, right? So when I started out, you'd read a paper and somebody would say, you know, I have a breakthrough and it's really great. And you'd have to contact the researcher and beg them, could I see what you did or find out more about it? Now it's just, here's a repo. People are sharing more openly. And of course, new and refined techniques that we're seeing tremendous improvement in the algorithms that people are using to apply to these problems. And these are all kind of interdependent, right? It's not like any one of these is operating in isolation because we have more open access to data. We can try things. We have cloud computing so we can attack bigger problems. It's all kind of amplifying itself into what I think of as a perfect storm over these last you know, five, six years, something in that time frame. This is kind of modeled by this graph. Um, this graph is showing you the number of project directories in Google's source tree. Google has this monolithic, biggest source code tree in the world type thing. Uh, don't, don't quote me on that. I'm kind of exaggerating in, about in the world, but it's really, really big. And uh, this graph is showing you the number of unique projects 
inside that repository that include machine learning uh, configurations. And it kind of gives you a sense of what's happening of this revolution I just talked about. Pretty much every product and service that Google offers is now built using machine learning or uses machine learning in some significant way. And I'm sure you've all started to experience that already in many, in many different products. So that's a little bit of background. Um, now I want to talk about what I'm, what I'm calling superpowers. Um, but before I talk about that, I want to give you a little bit of my history and where my first, how I first discovered my, my superpower. Um, when I was probably, does anybody recognize this? No, you, you were, no, none of you were, okay, there's one person. There's another guy. None, most of you weren't born when this book came out. But when I was in high school, I think I was about 15 or so, my brother, who was two years older, was taking a computer programming course, and he had this book on his dresser. And I was like, basic, basic, what does that even mean? That's a weird title. So I took the book, and I started reading it, and I just couldn't stop reading it. And I was thinking to myself, this is weird. My older brother's got a textbook, and I can't stop reading it. That's a good, that's kind of an interesting thing. That doesn't happen very often. So I got really interested in programming and started writing programs. And this is one I didn't write when I was 16. I wrote it more recently. But it illustrates the kind of magic that I felt. Um, to explain this program, I have to kind of give you a little bit, a bit of a puzzle. Let's imagine you're going to interview 100 people for a job. And the rules are that as soon as you interview one of these people, you have to decide right then and there. If you say no, you've lost that person forever. If you say yes, you're done, and you're not going to get to see any of the rest of the people. So what would be an optimal strategy? You know, if you choose, if you hire the very first person you see, you're obviously leaving a lot of information on the table. If you hire the last person, that's the one you're kind of stuck with if they're not so good. Anybody have a feeling for an optimal strategy? I have a feeling some of you do, but you're bashful. But um, this Python program is, so a lot of the slides in this talk you can click on, and it'll take you places like this. This is called Repelit. It's a site I really like for just doing interactive coding experiments. Um, so this 32-line program simulates that. What it's going to do is iterate and print out the optimal stopping point, right? So if you, if you in interview the first person to make a decision or the second person or out of 100, what turns out to be the optimal point? We'll run it. And it's converging, hopefully, on 0.37. Might not quite make it there. Um, it turns out the optimal strategy is roughly 37%. What I mean by that is you should interview 37% of the applicants. So if it was 100 people, you'd stop after 37. And you steal your nerves, and you say, I'm not going to accept any of those 37, no matter how good they are. And then the very next person you meet, you interview, who's better than those people, anyone you've seen before, you hire. OK? Now, what's amazing about this, this gives you the optimal strategy. It doesn't guarantee you're going to get the best person. It, it, it maximizes the probability of finding the, the best person. The actual probability of finding the, nest, the best person is the exact same number. And it's not just 0.37. It's 1 over e. So it's a very interesting problem. Why am I going into all this? Because with 30 lines of Python, I just was able to figure out something I never would have been able to figure out analytically. And I proved the answer by running, I don't know if you can see, 1,000 trials. I can actually run 100,000. Yeah, it's a little bit slower. It's Python. It's being interpreted somewhere. But this is what really got me excited. This is what blew my mind, using software. I can actually solve problems that I could never solve analytically. I can find the truth about things, and I can do things much faster than I ever could before. So it felt to me like a superpower. OK, back to my story. Whoops. I think I 
just do this. Okay. All right, so I got all excited about programming, and many years went by, and I became a professional software developer. Uh, but I got really frustrated because you get this feeling of, okay, I have my superpowers, but you can't use them, or it's really hard to use them. And the reason it's so hard is this is actually from Google's Kubernetes engine website today. And I don't mean to put down Kubernetes engine because it's an absolutely amazing product. And if you are interested in workspace workflow orchestration, you should absolutely take a look at it. But just to give a sense of what you have to do to deploy a web application, you, you need to pack a, package your app into a doc, Docker image, run the container locally, upload the image to a registry, create a container cluster, deploy your app to the cluster, expose your app to the internet, scale up your deployment, and deploy a new version when, you're, when you change the code. It's kind of a lot to deal with, and I think we can do better. Why is, it, why is it so complicated? Why is it so hard to use this superpower? Well, I have to worry about hardware. I have to worry about software. I have to worry about upgrading my OS. What version of Linux am I on? Do I have all the latest security patches? Do I know how to administer the network and scale my system up and down? And I'm just going to stop reading these. But there's a lot to worry about here. So this recently came out. This is a really cool cheat sheet of the Google Cloud Platform. So every product or service in the Google Cloud Platform is listed here and summarized in four words. Really nice, handy cheat sheet. But I look at this and I'm like, oh my god, how can I possibly learn all this, right? Like, how could I be an expert on all that? And it's that's just Google, right? You might also be interested in Microsoft or Amazon, and they probably have things like this. Maybe they're even more bigger. So it's a lot to, to swallow. What I really want when I'm building an application is I want servers, not services. I want unlimited automatic scaling. I want to pay for only what I use. I want it to be endlessly extensible. I want to be able to add functionality very easily. And I want to really relegate the infrastructure. I don't care about managing hardware or any of that other stuff that I listed. Another way of thinking about it is I don't want to think about stuff I don't want to think about. I just want to worry about my app. And also, when I am specifying something, I want to specify the what, not the how. I want to say, this is what I want to happen. This is the data I want to get. This is the you know, flow I want to happen. I don't care how you do it, just do it. Okay. So let's talk about some examples of how you can get those kind of superpowers in the modern world. Uh, this is Google BigQuery. How many people have seen this or tried it or, or heard of it, hopefully? Okay. If you haven't seen this, it's really worth taking a look at. It's a database, essentially, or a... Or a a big data analytics system that has some really interesting properties. For one thing, it uses parallel processing across a very large number of servers so that you can scan through data. You can essentially run SQL queries for people who are familiar with database technology. And in the traditional database system world, you would avoid a table scan, right? If you want to do something quickly, you would create an index. With BigQuery, you don't need to worry about creating an index or figuring out ahead of time which field in a, in a schema to index. It's just very happy to scan every row in the, in the database. And it's very fast because it's got all the processors going in parallel. Let's take a look at that in action. So I have a couple of saved queries here. I'll just show them quickly. This one is looking at, we have a few public databases. You can, of course, upload your own data to BigQuery and do all this kind of stuff yourself, but there's a few pre-made pre public databases or data sets. This one is all of GitHub, and I'm just looking at one month worth of commits, but all the commits in GitHub, and I'm looking at the different languages and sorting and grouping by language. Anybody want to guess 
what the most popular language is among committed files in GitHub? I just gave away the answer. <laughs> I have to learn to pause at certain points in this talk. Um, JavaScript, probably not surprising because, you know, every client on the web runs on JavaScript. Python is above Java. That's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if you saw how fast that was, but we processed 40 million rows of data, um, but what you may or may not know is I cheated because BigQuery has this field called use cached results. And I ran this query before the, the talk, so I'm going to turn that off because I just saw the timing and it was like 0.017 seconds and there's no way that that's actually possible <laughs> or it's not yet. So I'm going to run it one more time and it's probably going to take more like 15 or 20 seconds. But remember, it's looking at 40 million rows. Here's where I get nervous, right around here. Okay, so that's not too bad. Same results, and now that didn't use a cached result, it was 16 seconds. Let me take, let me show you another one. Uh, GitHub number of authors. Um, this is looking at all the repos, again, for a particular month, I think. And it's going to tell me the repos that have the most authors. Anybody care to venture a guess? I should have, like, if I'm going to ask you questions like that, I should have prizes, right? Otherwise, there's no, <laughs> there's no incentive to, to raise your hand. What was that? Linux kernel. Linux kernel. Good guess. It's actually in the top, top. It's not number one, but it's up there. And again, this is where it starts to get scary, but I think it's going to come through for me. <coughs> dot files. So for anybody who's not familiar with dot files, these are like, you know, the dot bash profile or the dot vimrc, all these configuration files that command line people and, and IDE people use. People like to share those apparently. And I see Linux is number four, so that was a good guess. Um, one more that I want to show you just for pure amazingness. This one's looking at all of the Wikipedia queries in one entire year. So this is page views from Wikipedia, okay? Not edits. This is like everybody that looked at anything on Wikipedia got logged, put into this data set, and we're going to analyze it. We're going to scan every row of that data. And more, more than that, we're not just going to scan it. We're going to, sorry, this is too small. We're going to run a regular expression um, comparing the title to two different cities. And I'm going to fix that right now because I realize how impolite I'm being. <laughs> OK. So let's run this and see how long it takes. Remember, we're running a regular expression, which is you usually avoid that on every single row of a of a pretty huge table, billions of rows. Need some music or something. Right? <laughs> Come on, BigQuery, you can do it. The theme. What's that? The Jeopardy, the Jeopardy theme. theme. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, 26 seconds, I'm gonna say. Let's look at the results. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> you, guys, you guys came in third place. But, but there's a consolation prize here. You beat Paris Hilton. Um, you have to remember this is, this is coming from data from 2011. That's why Paris Hilton was, was uh, showing up at all on this list. Anyway, um, just to show you what that did, it's 600 gigabytes, right? Almost a terabyte. 17 billion rows of data in 25 seconds. That feels like a superpower to me. There are lots of interesting things you can, no, I didn't mean to do that. I wanted to select it and of course, 
Okay. There are lots of interesting things you can do with BigQuery. Um, I mentioned the pre-built databases. There's one data set that's kind of really cool if you're interested in the evolution of the web. Um, there's something called the HTTP archive. Uh, Google goes out and every 15 days, twice a month, they visit the 500,000 most popular websites in the world. And they just gobble up all the data. Not, that's not a good way to say it. They take measurements. <laughs> really bad, bad wording there. Can we go back on the recording? I'm just kidding. They take measurements and they look at things like how much are people using this header or that header or that part of the HTTP protocol. Um, an example would be this graph, which is showing what's the evolutionary progress of encryption, HTTPS versus HTTP. Kind of an interesting question, right? How fast is the web moving to being more secure? You can figure those things out by looking at this data set. This data is available to you now. If you're interested in these kind of queries, you can query them. Uh, and I think this might be a link, too. If it's not a link, no, it's not. But I'll add a link to this image. Um, you can use BigQuery and do queries on this data set as well. Um, another interesting thing is the GitHub archive. So all of the commits to GitHub are being stored in BigQuery. So if you're interested in like the software ecosystem, the open source world, all kinds of fun stuff you can do, one of which I showed you earlier. Um, this one I'm going to kind of just gloss over because I think I might be going a little bit late on time. But uh, this is uh, Data Studio, which is a Google Cloud platform for building dashboards, really nice dashboards. So you can drag and drop things. Um, I built this one as an actual dashboard. This is not a, like a mock-up. Um, I, I work on a team at Google that built this educational tool we call Code Labs. And this is a dashboard that tells us things about the Code Labs. So it's really easy to build these just by dragging and dropping. And it meets this criteria of a super-powered service for me, because I don't have to think about how many servers or how many databases or where the databases live or where the servers are allocated. I just make a dashboard and it just works. So really nice capability. We're also trying to move towards this kind of don't have to think about anything uh, in the machine learning domain. So we've got a number of different APIs you can use, vision, speech, and so on. Uh, we also have something called the cloud machine learning engine, which is more of a bring your own model. So you build your own TensorFlow model and you're more of an advanced user in that case. But you can deploy it, train it, and serve it from Google's cloud. Um, and just to give you a real quick example, it's a little scary seeing myself that big, but uh, just to give you an example, this is the Vision API. So you just can drag and drop a photo and it'll annotate it for you using Google's own ML model for you know, image analysis. And of course, it's fully programmable. So you can write applications that, that do the same thing. And again, you don't have to think about servers or any administration, you just start making calls. And so it'll give you results back like this. It'll say, OK, 93%, that's probably a person. Good. Uh, it's a man. OK. Uh, yeah. So I think they still need to do some work on the algorithm. But um, I do have a hairstyle. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Anyway, uh, it's really fun to play with. Check it out. And there's a nice demo just like that where you can drag and drop images and, and see what it thinks. And it does a lot more than just identify objects. It actually finds where faces are, gives you the coordinate of the different components in the faces. It will tell you if it thinks that face is happy or sad or angry. And I can demo all that, but I don't actually think I should because I should probably forge ahead here. Um, another thing that's really interesting is uh, this feature called Cloud AutoML. AutoML is basically saying, it's kind of like bridging the gap between these pre-built models and these roll-your-own models. So maybe you don't want to build your own entire model from scratch, but maybe the existing model, like the Vision API that I just showed you, maybe it doesn't quite do what you want. For example, that model will absolutely tell you if it's looking at a cat or a dog. But what if I had domain-specific need, like, is this my dog? That's where AutoML comes in. You can upload images that you label yourself. And what happens is your images 
get kind of grafted onto the end of Google's model. So it's kind of getting all the goodness of the existing model and just adding the, a step that you add to kind of tailor it to your needs. And I actually built the Miko detector. This is my dog, Miko. Um, I'm not going to show that now, but I built this Miko detector, and then I just grabbed a bunch of images from the web that looked like Miko but weren't Miko, and then a bunch of images of Miko, and it did actually did pretty well. So that's worth looking at as well. A really cool way to kind of find that nice happy medium between tailor-made models and building your own from scratch. Okay. Next section is. So I've talked about super-powered services. What if you want to build an app and you want it to be a super-powered app? You don't want to have to think about all that other stuff. The way I'm doing this is I'm building an app myself, and I kind of encourage you to do the same exercise. If you had an app to build, and I realize some of you do have an app to build or to maintain or improve, and that's why you're here, so that's great. But think of how you would architect that app so that it had these superpowers where everything just was taken care of and all you had to focus on was the logic. So the problem I tried to solve was that um, sometimes I have too many tabs open. Has anybody here had that case where like you have so many tabs you can't even tell what the tabs are? Everybody's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> Maybe some of you have it even now. Um, so about a year ago, I, I decided I'm going to, like, I'm just leaving these tabs open and I'm never reading them, so I'm going to drop them into a, a repository. So I started using Evernote. Ever, I'm not, like, trying to endorse Evernote. Google has something called Keep, which is very good. It's not so much about, like, what's the tool, but I liked Evernote, and it has this nice web clipper. So when you're visiting a website, you can just click a button and it puts it into your Evernote thing. Okay. What was the thinking there? Well, it was that sometimes I don't actually read these articles, but I kind of want to keep them, because I think someday I might want them. And if I put them somewhere, I can search and find them. So I just started putting stuff into Evernote, some stuff I would read and drop it in, some stuff I wouldn't even read. I'd be like, I'm not going to read that, but I do want to keep a record of it, so I drop it in Evernote. It fast forward to now. It's been about a year. I have 3,000 clippings. And it dawned on me that this this is like a repository of me. It's like everything I'm interested in is in this data. And that's kind of an interesting idea. And I thought, you know, the, this is fun. It's good to have. But what can I do with it? I'm still spending a lot of time, like, looking for interesting stuff, right? I go to Hacker News. I go to Twitter. I go to news, online news sources. And it's like annoying to have to pull all these sites. So I want an app that goes and gets it for me. But how does it know what I'm going to like? That's the idea. I want something that will be a curation engine for me. So I looked at something called Doctavec. For people who aren't familiar with it, there's a technology called Word2Vec, which maps a word based on where it is in the context of a document to a vector. And the vector can be any number of dimensions based on how you do the calculation. The more dimensions, you're probably going to get more refinement, but it's going to cost more to calculate it. doc to vec is a generalization of word to vec It does the same kind of transformation on a whole document. So this is the code to actually generate it. I'm using something called GenSim. Uh, I guess there's not really a whole lot of point in showing this, other than that it's very, actually quite easy to build this. I don't have to think too much about the underlying algorithm. And I can take the output of this model and I can visualize it, so I'll show you that now. I actually have to just fire up TensorFlow, or TensorBoard rather. So this might take a minute to start. And it's going to start up a tool called TensorBoard, which gives me the ability to visualize the trained model. OK, and there we are. So now if I go to, now um, what this model is, is a whole bunch of vectors, like I said, in n-dimensional space. And you can pick n to be whatever you want it to be. I picked 200. 
So these are 200 dimension vectors, which people, humans can't really conceptualize, right? What, what does a 200 dimension vector look like? So we can use something called dimension analysis to reduce the space to two or three dimensions to get a handle on what it actually looks like. So I'm using the projection tool in TensorBoard, and here's my model. And you can see it has these certain clusters. If I hover over a particular article, introducing TensorFlow Hub, that sort of like, yeah. So, I mean, and I can search for things and see where they, what, what things match our closest neighbors to that. So this is really kind of a model of my brain in some ways, I think about it. Um, now, what can I do with this? I can use this model to calculate the vector distance between any arbitrary text and my cluster, right? So this is my curation engine. I can look at any article. I run it through the same Doctovec model, and I get a 200 dimension vector. And I can calculate the distance of that vector to my next closest vector in my cluster. And that becomes a measurement of how interesting that will be to me. So I did that, and I did some tests. Uh, I just picked some random stuff, stuff that I thought I would like and not like. How Singer won the sewing machine war, I thought I wouldn't like. These are between 0 and 1. It was a 0.5 because it's kind of an interesting business story. So it picked up on that, that I do like stories like that, even though I'm not a sewer. Uh, Beanie Babies, yeah, that's not going to score high for me. The Monty Hall problem, anybody know what that is? I, I love the Monty Hall problem. Uh, the weird, dangerous, yeah, that's interesting. And then pets who helped solve their owner's murders. This one scored lower than I think it should have. Like this, I would stop and like put everything down to read that article. So <laughs> I think that should have scored higher. But anyway, I'm going to kind of zip along here because um, this is a work in progress. I'm trying to build out this model or this application, and I've really focused on the model so far. And I've got something that I'm relatively happy with. I'm going to continue tweaking it. But the next thing is to understand a whole application. And so I've divided it up into three phases. And I've got an architecture diagram to say how I think I might do it. And this is really where the how would you solve this in a way where you didn't have to think about, about infrastructure comes into play. This is the hard part. So I expect to learn a lot as I go down this road. But uh, as I say, it's a work in progress. Some of these pieces are working, some are not. Um, but as I'm doing this exercise, I'm learning some interesting things about some capabilities. For example, in this diagram, uh, there are these alarm clocks, which are basically scheduled triggers that I want to fire off at a certain time to make something happen. How do you do that? Well, typically, you do something like cron, the, the automated scheduler in, in Linux. Uh, but that has to run on a CPU somewhere. So you'd create a VM and you'd run cron. No, I don't want to think about VMs. I want something where I can just say, here's the thing I want to happen. Make it happen at this time every day or whatever other schedule I want. Well, we now have something called Cloud Scheduler, which is exactly that. It's uh, cron in the cloud. Uh, we have Cloud Builder, which is, again, a, a CI type system like Travis or Jenkins also hosted in the cloud. Also, you don't have to think about provisioning anything. It just works. Uh, cloud functions, you've heard a lot about. We have cloud functions now for a few different languages. So that's also a very exciting possibility for making these super-powered apps. Um, we have nice cryptographic key support so that you can, you know, if you're in a cloud function and you want to use a set of credentials that are encrypted, there are nice ways to do that where you can submit the encrypted version into Google Cloud Storage and then access that in a cryptogra cryptographically safe way. Um, sort of flying through here. How many have five minutes? OK. The last section I want to talk about is, is learning. How can we make learning super powered, really easy for people without having to worry about administering things? Um, I'm really excited about a tool called Jupyter Notebooks. These are interactive tools that give you the ability to, um, not tools, they're notebooks. They're documents that contain instructional content and then interactive content built right into the notebook. Um, now, the typical problem with Jupyter is you'd be like, yeah, I love this system. How do I make it available to my students or my coworkers or whomever? And you'd be back to this, OK, I need a server. I need to run 
the Jupyter server on a VM or something like that. I'm excited about this service from Google called Collaboratory because it's hosted Jupyter notebooks. In addition to that, it's well integrated with Google Drive so you can you know, um, fork people's notebooks, copy them, share them, and so on. So really nice tool. Uh, one of the things you can do right now is test out a TPU. So these notebooks, hosted notebooks, have access to GPUs and TPUs. You don't need to give us your credit card to use this. You can go there right now. You can open up one of these notebooks and use a Google TPU and learn how to do machine learning. Now, there are usage limits, right? You're not going to build AlphaGo zero on, on this notebook, but you can get your hands dirty. And it, again, it feels like a superpower. You can do some amazing stuff. There's a site called SeedBank, which has snippets of machine learning algorithms available through Collaboratory. So pick one and run with it. There's one right here, which I, it, it uses a recurrent norm, neural network to sequence piano music that's never been heard before and maybe never should be heard. <laughs> okay, I'll skip over that because I don't, I don't know that that's gonna work, but anyway. Um, There's a video there of the, if I were to have been able to play that music to you, it would have been interesting, but not phenomenal. Uh, try the notebook yourself, see how you like it. But um, there's this video, which I'll invite you to listen to on your own, which is actually the winner of a competition, and it's mind blowing. It's somebody who did a generative algorithm to create music for a four part uh, orchestra. 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 I was gonna, there's a word with a Q, but I can't remember. Quartet. Quartet, thank you. Uh, so the, they actually got people together live on stage to perform this piece and a bunch of other award winners. And listen to that, it's really mind blowing. So uh, I wanna just close by saying that, you know, you have these superpowers. I hope you're getting that message. Uh, and it's up to you to figure out which ones to play with and what to do with them. Uh, but my hint to you is don't get overwhelmed by the solution. Like if you look at all the different capabilities and all the different providers, it's easy to get overwhelmed. But start with a problem because that's really what matters. Figure out what problem you want to solve, what cool creative thing you want to do, and then let that drive the tools that you use. So that's it for me, and I'll just remind you to rate this session, please. Thank you, Mark, for being here. Thank Thanks. you for your presentation and sharing your knowledge. Thank you for your coming. Knowledge.